we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ. <laughs> Okay, so you already knew that a level from a platformer was going to be on a list about frustrating video game levels. The question is, what platformer do you pick? Well, look no further than the game with a title character that's based on an obscure marsupial, Crash Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot was the game that almost single-handedly convinced everyone to buy a PlayStation. And let me remind you, this is the same console that had Spyro the Dragon, Resident Evil, and Metal Gear Solid in its library. It was quite possibly one of the first games to give Super Mario 64 some fairly beefy competition, and has since been viewed as an extremely influential and important 3D platformer in the video game industry. Of course, since it was the 90s, Crash Bandicoot is a pretty damn challenging game, with even some of the earliest levels providing a fairly high level of difficulty. Take Hog Wild, for example, a level that, as the name implies, tosses Crash onto the back of a hog while frantically trying to grip on for dear life as it sprints through a tribal village. To be fair though, I'd imagine that riding on the back of a wild hog wouldn't exactly be a cakewalk, so at least Crash Bandicoot gets points for immersion and realism. What if I told you that completing the original game could have been even more arduous than before? Well, during the game's development, a level known as Stormy Ascent was going to be a part of the game's main selection of levels, but was scrapped before release because the developers deemed it as too hard, leaving the level incomplete and inaccessible through traditional means. And that's the end of the story, next entry please. Well, fuck. Of course, when the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy released in 2017, it was a triumphant return for the titular Bandicoot, as it was his first game in almost 10 years. Since the Insane Trilogy was a from-the-ground-up recreation of the first three games, Vicarious Visions decided to go the extra mile and give fans exactly what they wanted. And I'll give you a hint, it wasn't one of these. In the form of DLC, Crash Bandicoot fans were finally able to try out the long-lost level, which, if you ask some, was an excellent bonus to an already fantastic remake collection. But if you ask others, they'll tell you that this this level can go to hell. I'm one of those people. Stormy Ascent, the level that was scrapped due to being too difficult, is here in its full glory. Glory, however, is not a word I would use to describe it. You know the level Slippery Climb? Pretty tough level, right? Well take that, crank its difficulty up by 10 notches, and throw in enough rain to give a Radiohead fan even more incentive to bawl their eyes out, and you've got Stormy Ascent. First off, you have to understand that Crash 1 is all about doing three things, and three things only. Spinning, jumping, and running. No sliding, no double jumps, no body slams, and absolutely no bazooka. That means you have to have pinpoint accuracy in almost every single one of your jumps as you traverse up the castle, all while avoiding spikes, disappearing platforms, bizarre bird creatures, and scientists who are throwing their week's worth of research at you because they're trying to convert Crash to Scientology. But Crash isn't a Scientologist. He's a bandicoot. And once you finally make it to the end of the level, it's all over. Thank God. But then you have the time trials. After completing a level, you're able to return and complete an optional time trial, which, as the name implies, is all about finishing as quickly as possible. Joke's on you, Crash Bandicoot, I'm already more than efficient at doing that in real life. Just ask my girlfriend. And this takes the difficulty to a whole other level, as you now have to endure a near-perfect run with no breaks, no chances of catching your breath, and not even a second to appreciate Crash shivering in the cold rain as he rethinks his life choices. Luckily, however, the developers had recognized this and decided that maybe they were pushing things a little too far and released another difficult level. Well, luckily, Crash 4 fared a bit better. Dude, this is so strange because it's mixing so many different mechanics. It's like go upside down and on the wall and backwards and die. All right, fine, you win, you little orange bastard. Now look here, son. I got a problem and I reckon you could help me with it. I'm no builder. No, I was thinking more of your demolition skills. Now this here... Grand Theft Auto is an icon of the video game world, and even a statement like that is severely downplaying the impact that this legendary franchise has had in the world of digital entertainment. It almost single-handedly created what we now know today as the open-world genre of video games, which places emphasis on exploration, immersion, and in some instances, extreme violence that arose from a local pedestrian bumping into you in traffic. If you haven't heard of it, what kind of rock are you living under and what are you doing with your life? Have you seen the number of clicks that GTA 6's trailer has racked up? If I ever get this many views, maybe my parents won't be disappointed in me being a YouTuber. Grand Theft 
Theft Auto 3 was the game that helped pioneer the modern open world genre, but it was Vice City that somehow took the formula and made it even more stylish and enjoyable. With a more cinematic rags to riches story, a more personality filled protagonist in the form of Tommy Versetti, and neat additions like different outfits and more weapons to add to your arsenal, Vice City was a sequel that managed to take an already fantastic game and make it even better. When cruising through a neon soaked 1980s era city inspired by Miami, Florida, you're obviously going to come across a few odd jobs that you'll have to partake in to make ends meet. Early on in the game, Tommy Versetti is tasked with blowing up a construction site, but it's not exactly done in the most conventional fashion. You first have to head on over to a van that holds supplies for a toy company known as Top Fun, and inside you'll find a remote control helicopter that'll be used to aid you in your quest for architectural destruction. What happens next could only occur in either a video game or the state of Florida, and luckily GTA Vice City checks both of those boxes. You use the remote control helicopter to pick up and drop bombs in numerous areas on the construction site, all while avoiding workers who are doing their best to prevent you from demolishing the building, even though they're not even getting paid for that. That is some top tier work ethic. Now while the idea might sound ridiculous, it could be pretty damn fun if implemented well enough. The problem is that it's not. Firstly, while later GTA games had pretty decent flying controls, the older titles feel extremely janky and sloppy when it comes to controlling any type of aircraft. That means you're essentially zooming through a construction site while colliding with nearby walls enough times to trigger a destroyed toy helicopter, a failed mission screen, and probably an empty wallet after having to buy three new controllers. Secondly, the RC helicopter doesn't have the carrying capacity to hold more than one bomb, meaning that after you have one set in place, you have to backtrack all the way to the resupply point, get a new bomb, and find a new location to place it in. And remember the workers from earlier? Well clearly they prefer airplanes because they're gonna try to swat you down like a fly with a helicopter blade. Well little do they know that toy helicopter blades apparently render people paralyzed upon contact. Thankfully, after dropping off the last bomb, you get to witness the satisfying view of watching this godforsaken building get absolutely decimated by the explosives that you deployed. And you get the sweet, sweet monetary reward of... a thousand dollars. Okay. Look, I could use a thousand dollars right now, but this is GTA currency. A thousand dollars in Vice City is the equivalent of 50 cents in some belly button lint in real life. Luckily, this would be the last time that GTA bestowed the player with such rage-inducing missions involving toy helicopters. Launch the Red Baron. Damn you, David Cross. Let's go. One. When the original Super Smash Bros. released back in 1999, it was a groundbreaking title that blended fighting game and platforming mechanics into a fun, highly accessible, and occasionally chaotic experience that kept friends on the couch longer than a plate of pizza rolls and a TV with Orgasmo playing on it. Since then, it's been noted with creating the concept of the platform fighter, and has spawned successful and critically acclaimed subsequent entries, as well as a competitive scene that loves Nintendo crossovers far more than a stick of deodorant and a basic sense of hygiene. Who needs napalm strikes and poison gas when a Smash Bros tournament could single-handedly wipe out an entire militia's worth of enemy forces. The military's putting the wrong people on the fight lines. Smash Brothers is an interesting case when it comes to tournament rules because unlike traditional 1v1 fighting games, Smash Brothers places emphasis on its platforming aspect just as much as it does the fighting. In other words, it's less about whittling away your health and more about racking up damage before eventually sending your opponent careening off the stage into the depths of god knows where. <laughs> Wherever it is though, it's gotta be worse than the depths of hell, because within two seconds they come running back to the stage, like a dog fetching a stick, or a cheapskate alcoholic driving to an Applebee's. Of course, with this in mind, it should be no surprise that Smash Brothers has a wide variety of stages, each with their own layouts, mechanics, and visuals to make each one feel unique and distinctive. Generally, whenever a new entry is released, you'd see stages that would coincide with recent releases from Nintendo. For example, Brawl has stages based on Twilight Princess and Wind Waker, Ultimate has New Donk City and Moray Towers, the list goes on. Brawl in particular was interesting because it contained stages that were based on recent entries in Nintendo franchises, but also had a couple of stages that I like to call the retro throwback stages. The first one is based on Mario Bros, and no, I'm not talking about this game, I'm talking about the one that was released two years prior. It's a fun stage, nothing mind-blowing or game-changing by any stretch of the imagination, but still an enjoyable callback to an arcade classic. But then you have 75 meters, a stage based on the level of the same name in one of the most important titles in video game history, Donkey Kong. 
I don't need to tell you how much of an impact this game had, but what I do need to tell you is how botched the Smash Brothers representation of this iconic game is. I'll just tell you right now, absolutely no one likes this stage, at a competitive level, a casual level, or even for the sake of humor. Nobody likes picking this stage. Instead of being based on the first level of Donkey Kong, which, if you ask me, makes the most logical sense, it's based on the tertiary level known as 75 meters. In this level, Mario has to use elevators to get to Donkey Kong, all while avoiding springs that can hit you with such force that they cause lethal, uncontrollable spinning, and probably an extra 25 cents out of your pocket after realizing it was your last life. Even after death, Uncle Sam always gets his pay. Now, for some reason, the developers thought that this was the level that needed to take a slot in Brawl's roster. As you'd imagine, it did not translate well into Smash Brothers, with minuscule platforms, sentient flames, and a pixelated Donkey Kong that taunts you while the spring bounces down on the fight line and causes more headaches than a fully stocked daycare. It's one of those rare stages that almost everyone universally despises. And if you ever find someone who admires this stage, then you've probably already won the lottery, got struck twice by lightning, and managed to capture Bigfoot on camera without shaking it like a addict who needs his fix. As you can imagine, it's not at all competitively viable, not even if you play this with the Final Destination and Battlefield variants of it. The sad part? This thing has been in every subsequent entry since Brawl, and it remains a sore spot in the franchise's impressive list of stages. What a damn shame. That was some tunnel. I'm all the way to the edge of the petrified forest. Alright, so fun fact about me, I actually have a huge amount of love and respect for the point-and-click adventure genre. There's something so cathartic about venturing on a journey, solving puzzles, and picking up seemingly meaningless objects that end up having a profound impact on the progression of the game. My all-time favorite point-and-click adventure game has to be Grim Fandango, or Fandango? I'm not 100% sure. A wildly inventive and hilarious journey that puts you in the shoes of Manny Calavera, a travel agent who specializes in helping recently deceased souls find their way into the afterlife. It is a highly underrated adventure that, luckily, in more recent years, has been given the attention that it rightly deserves. Now, this game was released during a period of time where point-and-click adventure games were pretty damn popular, but also frustratingly convoluted with some of their puzzles. Obviously, this game is no exception, as there are more than a few instances where a nearby computer with a guide on the game can prevent you from being in the same area for a prolonged period of time. There are more than a few examples that I can think of, but one of the first major roadblocks that I can remember when playing this game comes in the form of the Petrified Forest. Very early on, Manny leaves his job in order to find his top dollar client, Mercedes, who abruptly left town without any sort of forewarning. Manny ends up in the Petrified Forest where he finds his driver, Glottis, sobbing uncontrollably after losing his job, and it's up to you to figure out how to advance. Now, I'll tell you right now, this part of the game might as well be an early indicator of whether or not your problem solving skills are up to snuff. To start, poor Glottis has lost his heart. And I don't mean that he's turned malicious, I mean he ripped out his heart, threw it in the woods, and ended up getting it stuck in a spider web. For most, this would signal immediate death, but for Glottis, it was just an ordinary Tuesday. Now what do you think you're supposed to do in order to get Glottis' heart back? Well, you have a scythe that should be able to tear open the spider web with relative ease, but oh, what's this? The spiders are a bit too fixated on the heart. So, like any logical person would, you pick up some nearby bones, chuck it at the spider web, causing the spiders to immediately become disinterested for some reason, and then use your scythe to fling the heart back at Glottis like it's a makeshift slingshot. Then, after retrieving Glottis' heart and performing impromptu cardiac surgery on him, Heart! Heart is good. Be good to heart. Don't tear out heart! Heart is good! Strong, beating good heart! Hey, is that my car? you're able to explore the rest of the petrified forest in style. And if you thought it was already a little confusing, don't worry, we're just getting started. First, there's the tree puzzle. Glottis wants to partake in this game's rendition of Pimp My Ride by fully decking out the vehicle's wheels. The problem is that the parts are located on the top of this mechanical tree, and the only thing Glottis provides Manny with is a wheelbarrow and his optimistic attitude. You have to line the wheelbarrow's tire on the pumps connected to the tree in a way that causes it to violently sway back and forth, and then turn it off so Glottis can cheerfully attempt to weigh it down with the obvious objects in the wheelbarrow. Now, the first time I tried figuring this out, I initially believed that Glottis climbing up the tree was just a fun little detail that the developers decided to add in so that you, the player, could pull the most dangerous practical joke on him for comedic effect. But no, you have to partake in this cruel act of trickery in order for Glottis to get the parts down. And all I can say is thank god he has the brawn instead of the brains, or else it would be really tough to explain why Manny decided to mess with him for the twelfth time in a row. That was a dirty trick, Manny. Oh, it was an accident. 
I bumped the switch with my elbow. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't quit your day job, Gladys. Oh, wait, he was fired. Never mind. Then we get to the part where most people tend to be confused, the forest maze puzzle. If you head on over to the left side of the forest, you'll stumble across a stretch of land with a plethora of trails surrounding the area. Go into one and you'll pop out the end of another one like it's a gag from a 1930s cartoon. You might think there's a pattern to all of this, like maybe if you enter one passage and appear in another one, you can match the entryways and figure out which one leads out, but that's not it. It's simply red herring for the actual solution which has stumped many players, including myself, to the point where they're perpetually stuck in the petrified forest. You want to know how to solve this? Leave the area, yes, I'm serious, and head on over to this sign at the entrance and hightail it all the way back to the maze area. Plant it in the ground and watch as it points you in the right direction. <laughs> All right, sweet, time to get Glottis and finally get the hell out of here. Except, wait, that's not quite the solution either. This level really is a bone to pick with me, doesn't it? In a bizarre turn of events, you're actually supposed to place the sign down, go to the general area that it's pointing at, pick the sign back up, and place it in said area. Keep doing this until you hit the sweet spot, and congratulations, you finished the level. Just kidding, it's not over yet bonehead. The final segment of this part of the game culminates with you having to find a way past these flaming demon beavers. No, I'm not making this up, stay with me. Glottis could just drive over them, but he instead embraces his inner cowardly lion and refuses to pass without the demon beavers properly disposed of. But that's an insult to the cowardly lion because at least he ended up earning his goddamn courage, and he wasn't even the one with the axe. You firstly have to get at least three bones, either from the aforementioned spiderweb area or from the bridge that the beavers are walking on. Head on down to the left and chuck the bones in the tar and you'll see the beaver jump in after it. That should be enough to distract them. No, it is sadly never that simple, as you not only have to throw the bone in the tar, but also have to pull out the fire extinguisher in your inventory, and at just the right time, blast away at the beaver as it jumps in. Initially, you might think that you're doing something wrong because two more beavers show up after him, but don't worry, it's not a trick. Just rinse and repeat and you'll thankfully get this part of the game done. Now it's time to head back to Glottis and mollywop the fuck out of this gate and proceed to the rest of the game. Manny, look at that badass gate! I can't drive through that! We have to find the key! Oh my god, are you fucking serious? Comes a bonus thing. Okay, okay, so this technically isn't a level, but in what other instance am I going to be able to talk about the Beaver Bother minigame from Donkey Kong 64? Donkey Kong 64 was the final collectathon 3D platformer from the legendary studio Rareware, when they were still working under Nintendo. And if you ask me, it's a fantastic 3D platformer that'll keep you hooked from beginning to end. At the time, Donkey Kong 64 was easily one of the most ambitious 3D platformers of its time, giving you five different characters to play as, each with their own different abilities, objectives, and even some character properties. Not just that, but each Kong gets five different golden bananas that they can unlock on each stage, totaling 20 golden bananas per stage. That's a lot of potassium. I'm surprised these guys haven't been puking after banana number 13. Now, some of the golden bananas are locked inside of floating barrels that you can find throughout the course of the game. These particular barrels contain simple yet fun mini games that, once completed, grant you the aforementioned gold-coated fruit. Some range from having to sneak behind some of K. Rool's minions, who somehow have access to walkie-talkies and flashlights, to having to maintain the balance of a group of snakes who are trying to keep turtles spinning on their tails. I can only assume that someone decided to bring pot brownies to work that day. Now, there are a couple of minigames that can provide a modicum of challenge, but the one that most people, myself included, absolutely despise is one called Beaver Bother. The premise is deceivingly rudimentary, as you play as a claptrap who's trying to hurt a group of blue beavers into an ominous black hole. And here I was thinking that you were supposed to stick something in the beavers. Despite the seemingly simplistic nature of the minigame, the aforementioned lakeside creatures are adamantly opposed to falling into the mysterious black hole. You'll be wasting precious time just trying to get these guys into the center, which will sometimes work, but other times their primal instincts kick in and they just decide to resiliently run in place, seemingly unaffected by a reptile with teeth that are sharper than the knives in my girlfriend's collection. Why do you think I'm always trying to get on her good side? There are two primary factors behind why this is easily the most frustrating part of the entire game. Firstly, if you've already made the effort to find this minigame barrel, you're probably already persistent enough to want to complete this thing and add a golden banana to your collection. And if you want that uber satisfying 100% complete, 
completion, well, you better get to bothering some beavers like it's a night at the brothel. And secondly, you have to get anywhere from 12 to 15 of these things into the center within the allotted time frame. 60 seconds sounds like a long time, but when you're inconsistently guiding beavers into a mysterious hole, trust me, it goes by quicker than you can blink. And yes, the claptrap that you're controlling can fall smack dab in the middle of the hole as well, so you not only have to be accurate in your herding, but also precautious. Funnily enough, you can actually replay this for your own pleasure at Snide's headquarters if you provide him with all of the blueprints, but why you would willingly put yourself through that level of torture is beyond me. I'll stick to the slot machine minigame, thank you. Now, for the last entry, we're taking a look at Kingdom Hearts. Before I start, I want to make it exponentially clear. I love Kingdom Hearts. I might prefer the second game to it, but the original Kingdom Hearts is still a fantastic and thoroughly enjoyable action RPG from beginning to end. Being able to explore worlds based on Disney films is a Disney fan's wet dream, and luckily, Kingdom Hearts satiates those type of people. I can say that because I am one of those people, and let me tell you, the dreams get fucking wild. Now, the original Kingdom Hearts admittedly does have some fairly confusing levels that you'll come across throughout your journey. Most people point the finger at levels like Monstro, Deep Jungle, Atlantica, and Agrabah, but those four levels, while definitely confusing in some areas, are still pretty fun to journey through in my opinion. However, one of the first worlds that you come across in the game is also one of the most convoluted, tedious, and cumbersome levels in the franchise's history. And I might catch some flag for this, but I don't give a shit. I fucking despise Wonderland and Kingdom Hearts 1. Let me explain. After leaving Traverse Town with Donald and Goofy and finally embarking on a quest to save Sora's friends, you get presented with the option of three different worlds to choose from. The only problem is that when you first board the gummy ship and load up the map, you have no idea what any of the worlds are. You have to make the trip first before you even know where you're going. Depending on which route you take, the first world you come across will either be Olympus Coliseum, Deep Jungle, or in this particular instance, Wonderland. Whenever I replay this game, I almost immediately go to Wonderland first, not because I like it, but because I can get the monotonous parts of the game out of the way. Way. When you first land here, things seem pretty cool at first. You follow the White Rabbit into Wonderland and are presented with potions that allow you to grow and shrink to access new areas or solve quick puzzles. It's a neat idea, I'll admit it. But once you get past the introduction, Wonderland becomes extremely aggravating. You're tasked with proving Alice's innocence after she's been locked away for allegedly committing a crime. The crime in question, no one knows. We could be trying to exonerate someone who murdered a card soldier, or even worse evaded her taxes. You're now tasked with finding a plethora of evidence boxes that can be used to aid Alice in her predicament. But I'll give you a little tip, you only need one and the outcome is practically the same every single time. However, this isn't the bulk of the issue. It's having to navigate this abhorrent slog of a maze disguised as a surreal woodland habitat known as the Lotus Forest. This section of the level is what almost single-handedly ruins Wonderland for me and many others. Half the time, you don't even have a modicum of an idea of where you should be going. And let me remind you, this is before the series gave you objectives objectives that provided at least a general basis on where you should be heading. If you don't know what you're doing, good luck, because you're going to be mindlessly running back and forth just trying to figure out where the hell you're supposed to even go in the first place. When I was younger, this level took me almost a fucking month to complete, which is either a testament to its confusing layout or to my low IQ as a child. You be the judge. Plus, this is the first Disney World that you can come across, so you have extremely slim pickings when it comes to abilities, meaning that you're constantly missing jumps, only have access to a basic three-hit combo and a fire spell, and your teammates go down faster than a bottle of Jack after you try to finish this damn level for the first time. The worst part is that when you finally start to get into the groove of things and begin to acclimate to the level's unnecessary confusion, it's practically over and it culminates with a surprisingly tough early game boss fight against a gangly armed fire juggler known as the Trick Master. You've got to position yourself on a table and leap towards him while swinging your keyblade and praying to the RNG gods that you can land a hit on him before landing on the ground. The saddest part is that Wonderland is the most fun whenever you come back to it later after completing it, because you have numerous traversal abilities that help make things less cumbersome and infuriating. By that point, the damage is already done, and venturing back to Wonderland after all that you've endured is more than enough to give the average Kingdom Hearts fan PTSD. Hopefully it doesn't return in Kingdom Hearts 4, but if it does, I'm really hoping that the developers give it a makeover. No, 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 not that one. But luckily, we won't have to worry about that for at least another 10 years. Which is quite depressing when you think about it. <sighs> well, Wonderland looks like I'm stuck with you.